Sir. <laughs> Sandeep, we are on live now. We are live, sir. Uh, good evening, all the viewers. Uh, I would like to welcome on behalf of Indian Arthroscopy Society for this next Academic Corner monthly meet. So uh, we have to uh, uh, we have two uh, eminent uh, moderators, Dr. Melin Pimprika, who is a senior arthroscopy surgeon and one of the senior members from Indian Arthroscopy Society. who practices sports medicine in nasik he has been faculty in various arthroscopy courses in national as well as international level another uh, of a uh, speaker is dr vinay pandey he is uh, completed post graduation and he has worked with dr aishwari for 3 years in delhi and he started his independent arthroscopy practice in varanasi since 2010 over to you uh, dr bhrigar and dr pandey Yeah, Vinay, you can take over and introduce Dr. Raghavir Reddy for the first talk. Yeah, sure. Sir. Yeah. So, thank you, Sandeep, and uh, thank you, Indian Arthroscopy Society, for giving this opportunity. Uh, so, the first speaker is uh, Dr. Raghavir Reddy. He is from Hyderabad, a very senior arthroscopic surgeon and sports injury specialist, very well, well known across India. And um, he will be talking something about patellofemoral instability, a very tough topic to deal with. Uh, i think all the knee surgeons would be struggling with this particular topic so dr aguvir will highlight few salient features and points how to manage these injuries so i think dr aguvir sir are you there yeah i'm audible imminent yes, um... yeah you are audible so i am going to share the screen and um, he will be talking something about patellofemoral instability a very tough topic to deal with Uh, i think all the knee surgeons would be struggling with this particular topic so dr aguvir will highlight few salient features and points how to manage these injuries good evening friends i thank uh, ias committee for giving this opportunity to speak uh, in this platform for 20 minutes on the element of patellofemoral abnormalities <laughs> so great to see milan sir maheshwari sir uh, this is my favorite topic in um, in my initial first 15 cases of mpcl reconstruction done in uh, between 2006 to 2008 i did five year follow up and i come with a initial publication in igo and my first case was not in a recurrent patellar dislocation it was in a multi ligament injury it was immobilized in six weeks of cylinder cast elsewhere by my friend when i removed i tried to mobilize it was not coming then i did a midline approach extensor lateral release still was not coming i did this uh, place the hamstring graft put a anchor in the patella and made a femoral tunnel in the adductor tubercle but later in subsequently in 2006 i was attending isocos people were talking about uh, mpcl surgery and uh, placing the in the second layer of uh, knee capsule and uh, and doing it between the adductor tubercle and the medial epicondyle that's why you can see i was placed the graft on the middle retina retinaculum so without knowing i did this surgery with bit uh, then later it be, become uh, popular so coming to our topic uh, uh, cut the patellar mal tracking the patellar femoral joints has a low degree of congruency in initial first 30 degrees of flexion the stability is provided by soft tissue constraints beyond 30 degrees it is by bony shape this major and minor instability factors put forward by dijor namely tilt patter tt the distance trochea dysplasia patella alta excessive external femoral torsion excessive tibial torsion genu requitum and valgum they put acute threshold and they cause epiphyseal rupture and this leads to chronic patella instability So that's why our goal is to do the MPCL reconstruction and do the bony surgery whenever it is required. For that, proper history, examination, and radiology is important. And if you can place in three groups the patients, first group is objective patellar instability where the history of dislocation and at least one anatomical radial abnormality is there. All these they require surgery. Second group is potential patellar instability where there is no dislocation 
but they have radiological anatomic abnormality most don't require surgery painful patella syndrome they don't have a dislocation they don't have radiological anatomic abnormality these are not case for surgery so coming to examination look for the patellar retinacular tightness and the examination again i look for mal tracking so you see in this video the patella is dislocating in extension and getting residual inflection here the quadriceps length is normal here the patella is dislocating in flexion and getting reduced in the extension here the quadriceps length is short and j sign is a common thing is because of combined muscular imbalance upper trochlear dysplasia and there is no patella engagement in trochlear in extension and to radiology as we all know ttg distance put forward by gutler anything more than 20 m is an abnormal thing for indication for uh, bony surgery visual classification put forward for trochlear dysplasia type a is a shallow trochlear type b is flat type 3 is a double contour type 4 is cliff pattern and coming to patella alta commonly used as cd index anything more than 1.2 is abnormal and the sagittal patella femoral engagement index by dijo here the sagittal view of the mri you see the patellar cartilage contact with the trochlear cartilage a uh, 50% is normal so when you see the in the patellar alta if you see a radiological abnormality cd index more than 1.2 and if you see the index here the cartilage here is in come in contact so here only isolated epithelial is in sufficient but in this picture if you see there is no contact with the cartilage of patella and trochlea so this requires combined procedure epithelial and distillation and coming in the careful physical examination look for limb malalignment as we take for long leg radiographs you know frontal plane to suspect a rotation we take ct scan and i don't go in much detail in this top in this lecture if you suspect femoral aversion alone we can do derotation osteotomy either proximal femoral or distal femoral if combined femoral of uh, anti uh, more version and valgus we can do a distal femoral osteotomy after going through the history examination radiology then you select the procedures from the menu it can be a soft tissue procedures like lateral release lengthening quadriceps plasty rux golfe procedure galaxies uh, vmo plasty advancement middle peripheral ligament reconstruction bony procedures like uh, medialization of tubercle distillation or proximation of tubercle trochlear plasty and various osteotomies this boy is a 9 years boy history of patellar dislocation since the age of 8 years so i did lateral release vm uh, vv quadriceps plasty vm or repositioning and rooks goal thread procedure we can see in 5 years the how the trochlear remodeled the immediate post op same uh, another age group 14 years same history instead of uh, rooks goal thread i did a semitendinous stenosis and the 15 years girl have a dislocation since childhood so i did quadriceps plasty <clears throat> lateral release and epithelial reconstruction and this is the 6 months after the surgery this concept of proximal transfer of the tibial tubercular is brought by uh, mr fang from china here he doesn't do v way plasty because he felt that the there will be a lot of extensor lag and the mobilization is difficult that's why he brought the concept of proximal transposition of tibial tubercle of course he does epithelial in all his cases in mild cases he do a, it as a lateral retinacular lengthening vasus later as obliquus advancement in severe cases he does proximal transposition of the tibial tuberosity and a word about the patella infra at this juncture and uh, literature patellar tendon lengthening has been described for this coming to our interesting topic epithelial reconstruction why it is more popular now because it has low redislocation rates reduced risk of patellar femoral arthritis when compared to a distal realignment and good subject to outcomes here the epithelial is a non isometric ligament it becomes tight in extension lacks in flexion whereas lateral retinaculum is lacks in extension tight in flexion and one important point in this we should know in this slide is femur uh, epithelial attachment 2 mm anterior and 4 mm distal to the adductor tubercle put forward by laparotomy 
So biomechan studies shown that MPFL is the main restraint for the lateral patellar displacement, and MPFL reconstruction addresses the principal site of the pathology. Just like what we do, placing the collagen in ACL reconstruction and fixing the other ends, we are doing same thing here. But ideal graft should be similar stiffness but stronger than native MPFL. Since we commonly use the stiff grafts like Gracilis and Semiti, any small errors in graft length, especially if it is short, they can be decreased range of motion and more force on medial facet. If you're placing medial uh, MPFL reconstruct more proximal, there will be loss of knee flexion and excessive pressure on medial facet patella. Placing a reconstruction more distal, it causes over tight MPFL in extension and cause extensor lag. This is an isometric method. If your lengthening occurs in flexion, move the femoral attachment site more distal. If lengthening occurs in extension, move the femoral attachment more proximal. Now that uh, Shortel has come with this article, now surgery has become much easier. But still I do this, especially if you are doing the MPFL reconstruction combined with other bony procedures like distillation of tubal tuberosity. I use both a radiological and isometric method. So what are the graft to use? Uh, what are the strands, single strand or double strand? Uh, which are the implants we use, either patellar or fixed femur or no implant method. The outcome scores are anyway between 84 to 96, Kujala scores. So what it matters is, it is not the graft, it is not the uh, implants or no implants, it is the technique of surgery. Our MPFL graft should become lax with flexion. That's why proper female tunnel placement is important between adductor tubercle and medial epicondyle. Knee flexion angle is very important. Which are the angle patella engaged in trochlea, that knee position has to be maintained during the fixation of the graft. That's why between 30 to 60 and less tension is used while fixation. These are the more important facts. And later Amis has come with a double bundle concept of the two strands because a better rotation control during flexion and extension. And I don't go much in detail, but I use anchors because most of our patients, Indian females are thin. That's why I use uh, anchors on the patellar side. And uh, people know that MPFL kits have come, uh, making the surgeries much more uh, make make much more easier for the surgeon. So again, what I say is location of the femoral tunnel, knee flexion angle used, an isometric method, and less tension is used during the time of fixation. These three things are more important for the MPFL surgery. Is not the implants. So immediately range of motion is uh, allowed as tolerated and remove the brace once good quadriceps control is attained. So be careful, otherwise there'll be medial facet overload. You can go for uh, accelerated arthritis and avoid hardware prominence. Anyway, we, since we are not doing tunnels in the patella, so patella fracture is not there. It is MPFL reconstruction contraindicated in patella femoral arthritis, patella, permanent dislocated patella, and as they're not an isolated procedure in alignment abnormal, severe alignment. And coming to trochlear plasty, as I already told, trochlear dysplasia, type A is shallow, type B is flat, double contour to type C, and type D is a cliff pattern. Indications are patellar femoral instability at higher degrees of flexion, it is around 40 degrees beyond mid flexion instability. Positive J sign at higher degrees of flexion, high grade trochlear dysplasia, type B and D, and lateral tilt angle less than 11 degrees. And it's contraindicated in uh, children, open growth plates, mild trochlear dysplasia, early arthritis. So MPFL reconstruction will stabilize these instabilities in low grade dysplasia, but high grade uh, dysplasia requires trochal plasty and MPFL together. So in our principle is we are creating the new trochlear sulcus approximately three to six degrees laterally to previous sulcus. Thereby we are correcting the TTG distance proximally and thereby achieving the physiological patellar femoral engagement in early flexion without increasing the patellar femoral pressure. So Dijor has come with uh, thicker cartilage fracts and used to fix with staples, whereas Britair comes with thinner cartilage in his method and fix with vicryl uh, tapes. So when you go up to the trochlea, from the osteochondral junction, lift the periosteum, using osteotomes, lift the cartilage flaps, and using the burr, create the new groove, as mentioned previously. 
and the cartilage is split and fixed. So this was my first case. This girl already operated twice elsewhere. Um, extensive lateral release and extensive medial uh, VMOplasty done twice. Still pat, still patella dislocates. So you can see the dysplastic trochlea. So in 2010, I don't know much. So I took the advice from the Dijor. He said that make a staples from thinnest K wire available. So I did a lateral release, trochleoplasty, and MPFL reconstruction. And this is the six months after the surgery. And this is a new groove. And one year later, I wanted to remove the staple implant. This is a view from the superior lateral portal. You can see the new groove. And another case, this boy has come from UK for this surgery. He had patella subluxates even at 80 degrees of flexion. This is the radiological parameters. You can see even 60 degrees, 70 degrees, 80 degrees of knee flexion also patella subluxating. So I did a lateral retinal lengthening. So I approached the trochlea from the lateral approach. So you can use the patella zig if it's available, but most I'm more comfortable with the burr. So in this, I use civil lock anchors. So I use 4.75 in the intracoronal notch and take three to four pairs of vital number two sutures and fixed with mini civil lock anchors. By this fixation, the, I can mobilize patient much early when my, I used to use a Dijon method with staples, I used to immobilize the knee flexion of 30 degrees so that patella will press on the trochlea. But I used to have some stiffness initially, that's why. But if you have a good rigid fixation like this, you can mobilize much early, chance of stiffness is less. Now you can see uh, there is no instability even at 30, 40 and 70 further. It's stable. And this eight weeks post op. And he left to UK and not seen up till now. Coming to Petla Alta, CD index, anything more than 1.2 is abnormal. So 1.35, there are definite cases for the distal tubercle transfer. So two drill holes are made in the cortex on either end of the distal ostotomy to prevent the propagation of ostotomy. So you take six centimeters of uh, sh uh, big shingle, bone shingle. Distal portion is being cut to the required length. Calculate from 80 minus AP. And you trim to fit to flush into the bed. And bicortical fixation is used. And do the MPFL reconstruction after the distillation. And this is a post op x ray. Coming to in immature people, patients. We can do a hemi this for the guided growth for the valgus if it is there, or you can implicate the patella tendon if it's a patella alter and no trochlear surgery. Coming to the unloading of the patella femoral joint, these are the various procedures that have been described. Flat cut mediation when there is no patella femoral chondrosis. But if you have in lateral or inferior lateral cartilage lesions, so anterior medialization, percussion ostomy is described. Uh, there is lateral distal and with increased TTG distance. It can be combined with MPFL with large uh, TTG distance. Or it can be done for to protect the cartilage, you know, patella cartilage implant surgery. You see here, direction of the ostotomy from anterior medial to anterior lateral, various slopes. So if you want more medialization, there should be less angle of the slope, orthopedic this. If you want less mediation, more slope, 60 degrees causes, 
less medial edge. That's why you do arthroscopy and see the arterial cartilage where it is. If you have more lateral cartilage affected, you do more medial edition. So intraarterially, you can see the cartilage, and depending on that, you can do the angle of the slope. You can do it. I'm just forwarding, fast forwarding. But the focus is now starting. So good results have been uh, there for lateral and distal lesions, eighty-seven percent. Even they have been done for medial lesions, fifty-five percent results. But we have to combine with cartilage surgery of the patella. It is uh, this osteotomy is contraindicated is normal period distance, uh, medial patellofemoral chondrosis. But as a, as a isolated process. But if you combine with the cartilage, this can be done. Even medial patella also it can be done. Not as an isolated procedure for the large proximal pole patella and pan patella lesions. This patient, habitual dislocation of patella, 50 years, knee flexes up to 120 degrees only with patella dislocation. Patella placing trochlea give knee flexes up to 10 degrees. These are the pictures. So my friend wanted to do TKR. And he told me to do the realignment surgery, and I said we will do first realignment surgery and do TKR after six months. Now it is almost nine years. She didn't turn for TKR. So later release, quadriceps lengthening, MPFL reconstruction, and fulcus osteotomy are done. And this is six months after the surgery. HTO you can combine with tube proximal tubercle transfer. Where, especially when you are doing the HTO in elderly patients, where there is more patellofemoral cartilage lesions or larger correction angles, CD injections are better. So, if you do a medial opening wedge osteotomy, there will be patella baha. You can see this this distance comes down, patella comes down. So, this problem can be solved by shifting the tibial to posterior proximally. So, normally after doing osteotomy, we do ascending osteotomy. We, but here we do descending osteotomy. And this is one of my case. We did a proximal tubercle transfer on this. Uh, this is a 800 kg person, and uh, he had a larger correction. I did a 15 mm uh, bone graft, iliac crest graft. These are not my slides. This is uh, for competition sake. Patella Weberg uh, abnormal patella. And type two, three can go for the sagittal osteotomy, and they place the graft. And a middle facet patelloplasty again is described. This is a two a bilateral case. So this here on one side patelloplasty is being done and retinous follow up. There is less cartilage damage. On the other side, the patelloplasty was not done. So there is more OA changes. So take home message: MPFL reconstruction for recurrent patella instability shown good results when used alone when bone constructs are normal or near normal. When you want to combine. MPFL with other bony procedures, physical means the decision making is a, a physical examination science such as J tracking and delayed resolution of apprehension can identify the patients at a risk of failed isolated MPFL reconstruction. If apprehension results by 40 degrees of flexion and there is no J tracking, it is very likely that isolated MPFL reconstruction will be sufficient. But if apprehension results after 40 degrees of flexion, a significant J tracking is there. There is a likely a need of, of additional bony procedure. Low grade uh, dystrophias MPFL reconstruction will suffice, whereas high grade requires trochloplasty and MPFL. If TD distance is more than 20 mL, medial shaft tubercle is indicated. If CD index is more than 1.35, distillation and medial shaft distal tubercle. Anterior of tubercle when there is later and distal patella facet chondrosis. And no tubercle osteotomy if there is more medial or proximal pattern as an isolated procedure, but it can combine with cartilage surgery. Then we can do anteromedialization. Proximal tubercle transfer to prevent patellar baha, especially we are correcting larger angles and elderly patients. And few words about first-time patellar dislocations. All are treated conservatively unless they have a osteochondral fragment avulsion. Then we fix the fragment and do the MPFL repair. Or in the primary cases, suppose if you see a first-time dislocator, if you have high-grade trochlear dysplasia, abnormal bony path uh, pathology, 
those are the case might can be done as a first time patella dislocation surgery so this is an a individualized approach for each patient for each lifestyle I means an mr has a role for a decision making thanks for patient hearing thank you raghuveer it was an excellent and exhaustive presentation of uh, the expertise and the experience combined uh, there are no questions in the chat box yes so uh, Uh, let me begin with uh, uh, a few questions you have been doing this mpfl reconstructions for such a long period of time and uh, very aptly showed that you did a uh, uh, cemetery reconstruction way back when you did it not in the second layer but on top of the retinaculum yeah. so if you look at your journey back uh, what do you feel that it, there was a school of thought initially mpfl was thought to be a panacea you just do mpfl reconstruction and ignore the bony abnormalities and then the bony abnormalities came in the schools of trochleoplasties and all sorts of bony procedures so since when you have changed your practice and you have started adding bony procedures since when did you really get convinced that yes only mpfl does not work and what is your percentage of additional procedures when you are dealing with lateral patellar instability so i was doing mpfl isolated only from 2006 isolated yeah. till maybe 2012 uh, maybe 8 uh, 9 years most of my patients were uh, female patients hyperlax patients so i could get uh, good results with isolated mpfl mm mm-hmm. and uh, we have seen some cases of uh, maybe in retrospective uh, dysplastic patella i have not done as isolated mpfl in those cases stiff pattern so i started doing the as a bony procedure from 2011 10 12 so only selected cases that's why only if you are having a if patella is engaging beyond 45 degrees of flexion and is a uh, Uh, more uh, j sign at higher degrees of flexion those two signs are very much important if you can see those two, two signs take the decision that isolated mpfl is going to fail It has to be combined with some other procedure this is what i wanted to tell and my bony procedures is maybe is around 10% only 90% i do only 90 uh, mpfl only okay so there is uh, one more question from uh, mohsin there- siddiqui Yes, sir. from uh, YouTube, uh, uh, they, they've posted their questions, sir. Yeah. So, uh, should I read that out? Yes, sir. So, we'll just take this one more question and move with the second talk. And so, uh, he says that ideally, trochleoplasty should be fixed with vicryl tapes. Is it available in India? If not, with what you will fix it, sir? Both questions from Mozimul in YouTube uh, and... Uh, Vijay Patil asking any precautions we have to take for trochleoplasty. So, uh, Raghu, can you enlighten uh, on these two questions? Yeah, uh, vicryl tapes are available now in the market, uh, but I use a number two vicryl sutures. So, when you are fixing it, is the in the intercondylar notch with the bigger four point size swivel lock anchor. You take three to four pairs. Normally, we require three pairs. Yeah. because i'm going to fix with three civil lock anchors on either sides but you take four pairs four pairs of number 2 vicryl sutures yeah keep as a spare so that is sufficient so and uh, yeah, yeah when, please go yeah, ahead. when you are taking the uh, doing a thinner cartilage flap start with a small osteotome at the periphery once you get the depth then you can increase it Mm-hmm. and you should be very careful when you are going to the intercondylar notch mm-hmm. and uh, use the burr when you are creating the new sulcus mm-hmm. and uh, sometimes i felt using the burr also you can create the uh, cartilage flap yeah. and see that there should be at least 4 uh, to 5 mm of thickness 5 mm of uh, the subcondylar bone attached to the cartilage mm-hmm. And so i think if, they started using tapes because they thought that, that there could be a cheese cutting effect if you use a vicryl suture and that is why they have shifted, shifted to tapes 
Yeah. Since uh, it was not available that time, I started using. Started Vicryl, using okay. Vicryl, yeah. We have a very eminent and uh, one of the pioneers in trocleoplasty in the audience, Dr. Sachin Tapaswi. Uh, let us have uh, one opinion from Dr. Sachin Tapaswi as well. Sachin, can you just speak up? Unmute yeah. yourself. Yes. Opinion about? About what is the ideal suture material to fix your trocleoplasties? What is the ideal instrument which you use, burr or otherwise? And what is your choice of uh, 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 surgical technique for doing trocleoplasty? Okay, so I think um, pretty much what uh, Raghuveer has spoken in his talk, uh, vicryl sutures, number one, four of them, or number two, three of them, depending upon what sort of spread of sutures I want. Then the next question was a burr or a chisel. The answer is both. You start with a chisel and then you fine tune with a burr. And I forgot the third question. So the, uh, it was a question asked by one of the one of the delegates attending the conference, saying, "What precautions? What is the precaution which you would take while doing a trocleoplasty?" So I think selecting the correct patient is probably the most important uh, precaution that you should take. We are all all are aware that almost about eighty five percent of patients with a lateral patellar dislocation will have. Uh, trochlear dysplasia and all trochlear dysplasias do not require treatment. So correcting the or selecting the correct patient with a high grade trochlear dysplasia, especially those who show a supratrochlear spur and who have a cliff are the ones who absolutely require a trochlear dysplasia and um, you should reserve this procedure for them. Thank you. Thank you so much for that Thank wonderful you. answer. And uh, any other questions? I don't yeah, see any Dr. questions. Dr. Roshan Wade has asked one question, sir. Okay, so uh, uh, take that last question. So and then how do you address posterior lateral condylar dysplasia? That's a question by Dr. Roshan Wade, sir. How do you address the posterior lateral condylar dysplasia? So this in patients, <laughs> previously they are because like Albi graft. There is to elevate the graft uh, from the, we'll make an osteotomy from the lateral femoral condyle and elevate it. Um, but I have not done this procedure. So I do a, if there is a thing, I do a relative, create, I will relative the, I'll create a new sulcus and by removing the bone and do it. I don't do a, this elevating the, with Albi's graft. I have not done uh, a case in the lateral condyle hypoplasia. It has been described, but, but I have not done. Uh, I think, uh, Ravir, what the question is that there is a dysplastic lateral femoral condyle, posterior condyle of the LFC is dysplastic. So that will actually give you a valgus deformity yeah. in flexion. I, I think it is out of context to this particular aspect of uh, lateral patellar dislocation. So hypoplastic lateral femoral condyle, especially on the posterior side, will articulate with the knee in flexion. And um, I don't think it is going to be causing any form of patellar dislocation. And we will need to treat the current to its merits. Um, so I have a question. For, uh... All the panelists. Can I ask, sir? Yeah, please, Sandeep. Go ahead. Uh, sir, uh, 14 years uh, girl, first time dislocation, lateral uh, patellar facet osteochondral defect with TTTG distance of 14 mm and uh, femoral condyle visual type C. So, how uh, will you address it, sir? So that means uh, you want to ask that, uh, you, do you want to do a staged procedure and deal with the osteochondral fragment first? And since it is a first and time MPFL dislocator. Also torn, sir. Sorry, MPFL also torn. Correct. So your dilemma is probably since she is a first time dislocator, she has an osteochondral fragment. So fixation of the osteochondral fragment is mandatory. So your dilemma is whether to deal with all the conditions in the primary setting or you want to stage the procedure, right? Uh, they can have come after one month to me. Okay. With the injury. Okay. So who wants to take that question? Raghuvir, Sachin, Roshan? Raghuvir, Raghuvir. Yeah. Raghuvir? I have to fix the fragment. 
I have to fix the fragment and I will do the uh, MPPL repair. If it is quality, is tissue quality is bad, then I will go for MPPL reconstruction. So one hmm. month down there. Sachin, what would you do? So I think there are a couple of, uh, we're looking at four different issues here. Uh, how, what is the age of this patient? Uh, she's adolescent. Adolescent. 14. 14. 14. Yeah. So she's adolescent. That's one. Second, there is an osteochondral defect of the patella. We don't have any details of the size of the osteochondral defect, whether it is um, a small sliver of cartilage, how big is it, how much, what area of it, uh, of the cartilage, of the patella is involved. So osteochondral is and, osteochondral section. It's not a sliver. And, it's a sizable fragment. And what is unusual here is that uh, according to Sandeep, it's a lateral patellar facet. Otherwise, almost always, you will have a chondral injury of the lateral femoral trochlea and you will get a medial, facet. Of a medial facet. patellar facet. So I need to see what is going on here. This does not look uh, the normal situation that we're used to. Third issue is that this is one month old. So I don't think that fragment is going to be viable enough because the cutoff limit is somewhere around seven to eight days and results beyond three weeks are poor. So that defect uh, or that fragment will have to be treated with removal of the fragment, definitely. Second is that one would need to think of reconstruction of the fragment once we have better details with imaging and on arthroscopy as to what sort of, uh, you know, what is the location of that fragment, what is the depth, morphology, etc. The third issue is that she will always have a torn uh, medial structure because the patella has dislocated laterally and that needs to be tackled. Um, in an adolescent who is 14 years old, one can do both. If the growth plate is open, then I would probably do a soft tissue procedure like doing a uh, quad tendon, which is looped around the adductor tendon and uh, repaired back onto itself rather than making bone tunnels. If I find that she's, achu uh, she's achieved bony maturity, then I would use a suture anchor or make a small tunnel and uh, maybe choose a hamstrings graft. The next issue was that the TTTG is 13 or 14. So whether it is 13 or 14 on CT or MR is what we need to know because TTTG cutoff values are different for CT and MR. And MR. MR, if it is 14, then I would not be doing anything for the TTTG. I would let her run till adult maturity. And if by misfortune she re dislocates, then she will get a tubal tubercle procedure depending upon what her values are then only uh, when she attains maturity. So you can do a soft tissue procedure like an MPFL in a growing skeleton where you have high grade trochlear dysplasia, where you have an abnormal TTTG, you can counsel the parents, tell them that this is going to be a stopgap arrangement to prevent further episodes of subluxation, prevent contral damage, and then do the definitive surgery once they get uh, skeletal maturity. Well, what is the harm in doing such in what is the uh, since it's uh, your your uh, take is to remove the fragment, right? Where yeah. you feel that it will not be taken up. And uh, if you're going to remove the fragment, might as well remove it arthroscopically. Right. She's a first time dislocator. Right. So why not just remove the fragment and give her a chance? Yes, you can have a you can have an informed decision with the parents, speak to them about the risk because she's 14, then she has almost a 90% chance of redislocation. Put that on the table, have an informed decision. And yes, that is an absolutely correct way to go about it. There's no harm in doing that. But inform the family that she has a 90% chance of redislocating. If I were that kid's father, I would say, I do not want any further dislocation. I'm already on a negative side with uh, osteochondral defect, which has stayed out. My child has got a has got a defect and likely particular chondrosis, which is why I don't want a further subluxation. Uh, thank you, you so much. You agree, Raghuveer, or you disagree? Yeah, I completely agree. <laughs> so I was I want to take a chance, see the fragment. If it's viable, I will do fix it. How do I you guys, decide? How do you decide it is viable or not? You miss. I have to do arthroscopy during the surgery, and I'll decide. <laughs> One month that is non-viable. That's for yes, sure. yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> uh, why can't you think it as a uh, cartilage graft then, Sachin? It has been in a lively environment with the synovial fluid inside. 
uh, uh, so there's no data on that we don't have definitive data whether that loose body or that loose osteochondral fragment can be safely used as a uh, graft uh, anecdotal evidence is there that these uh, the rikigro people i mean the available company yeah, in, yeah. in our in our country has been able to culture cartilage but again i mean let me put let me spin the question the other way around um, uh, god forbid will your daughter is 14 she wants to have this and i tell you let's culture this or will you say it doesn't matter take a 3 mm plug but give me good quality cartilage let me spin it the other way around and <laughs> Huh? I, i think there are already uh, messages flashing that we are getting late sachin yes, we can please. have a discussion some other time thank you so much for that wonderful okay. discussion yeah so we move with the second talk of the day today and it is uh, going to be delivered by none other than anshu shekhar we all know anshu very well because he's been a integral part of the most popular knee show uh, in the country pune knee course and mentored by a very uh, eminent mentor like sachin tapasvi has started his private practice in raipur so anshu over to you for your case of patella instability with mal alignment thank you sir i'll share my screen now all right shall i begin yeah please yes okay so uh, good evening uh, all the delegates and uh, respected faculty members so this case is uh, on patella instability with mal alignment so the patient profile is she is a 16 years old female who complains of left patellar instability there is no specific traumatic event however she has had at least three episodes of painful dislocation which she remembers there is some limitation of activities of daily living like climbing stairs she is apprehensive of it however she has stopped playing sports uh, which is sad for a 16 year old girl on examination she had no effusion in the knee joint when she presented there was patella facet tenderness on the medial side the range of motion was zero to full with no limitation she had stable acl pcl and collateral ligaments the j sign is positive she is extremely apprehensive and the beton score was 2 out of 9 now on inspection of her entire profile it is very apparent that she has a valgus on the left side a straight leg on the right side and with no apparent hyperextension as seen from the lateral end now if you look at her gait closely she has decreased foot progression angle it is almost 0 degrees of foot progression angle now that uh, was a little worrisome because we should have been having a little bit but again the foot progression angle was uh, zero on both the sides this is examination under anesthesia the j sign is not very clearly visible here i'm sorry for the view but on x on flexion we see that the patella is coming back it is popping back in so it is basically unstable only in extension that is a hip internal rotation bilaterally symmetrical hip external rotation again bilaterally symmetrical that's the long leg radiographs which showed that on the right side which is the asymptomatic side the alignment was neutral however on the left side the symptomatic side the mucolage line was passing on the lateral end and when calculations were done to calculate the ldfa and the mpta it was found that she had a hip knee angle of 186 degrees odd which indicates a valgus mal alignment a ldfa of 86.8 which is normal and an mpta of 93.4 which indicates that the valgus is coming from the tibia along with a normal jlc of 1 degree on mri we see that the mpfl is attenuated something which is almost always present in a case of patella instability there is trochlear dysplasia which is only type a de jure the patella was very high riding there's a very long patella tendon seen indicative of patella alta and the menisci and collaterals and uh, cruciates were all normal so the patella indices were as such there is type a trochlear dysplasia the catadesion ratio is 1.3 the tttg on mri is 21 mm the lateral trochlear inclination is 10 degrees which is slightly abnormal the femoral antiversion is 21 which is normal 
and the external tibial torsion is 26 degrees, which is again normal. So what do, we, what do we have? What are we dealing with? So diagnosis would be a skeletally mature teenager with lateral, lateral patella instability who has a knee valgus with a deformity in the tibia, who has low grade trochlear dysplasia, who has significant patella alta, significantly increased TTTG, and an attenuated MPFL along with a normal torsional profile. So this is the full picture that we're looking at. Now, uh, we know Dejour, who's uh, a la carte approach. So in this a la carte, we definitely are looking at operative treatment since she has had more than three symptomatic dislocation episodes. Because the trochlear displays is low grade, we are probably not going to deal with it. Patla alta is significantly high with a CD ratio of 1.3. Since a tibial tubercle distalization is mandated, the TTTG is significantly high at 21 mm on MRI. Hence, a tibial tubercle medialization is again mandated. MPFL reconstruction, of course, uh, is a check range, so must be performed. However, the one component which is not part of Dijon's uh, a la carte is alignment, which is another significant uh, modifier in this particular patient. So from the menu, what do we choose? We choose to correct the coronal malalignment. Well, this is sort of out of the menu. Uh, to bring down the patella, to medialize the tubal tubercle for a very high TTTG, and to provide a dynamic check rein. So the surgical plan would be to perform an anterior midline exposure, to perform a tibial tubercle osteotomy to get a biological plate, which is at least six centimeters long, perform a medial closing high tibial osteotomy of five millimeters based on calculations, perform a tibial tubercle distalization of seven millimeters and medialization by five millimeters, and perform a quad tendon MPFL reconstruction. So all this was done. This is the post-op radiograph. I don't have any intra-op uh, uh, photographs because I did not intend to really, I didn't know it will turn out to be like this, but uh, this is her post-op radiograph. So we will see that is the medial closing wedge high tibial osteotomy fixed with a tomofix plate. Those are the screws for the distalization and medialization of the tibial tubercle osteotomy. The patella has now been brought down and that's the bio screw, which is used to fix the quadriceps tendon MPFL. So that is the six month radiograph showing osteotomies have well healed. The MPTA post surgery is at 88.5 degrees, which is now normal. The cathode ratio, ratio is now one, which is again normal. That is her range of motion at six months. So there is full extension going all the way to full flexion till the calf touches the posterior aspect of the thigh. She has good balance, good proprioception. She can perform single leg stance. She can perform squats without any pain. So that indicates good trunkle balance and good quadriceps strength. And her J sign has now gone. So that is good patellar tracking along with the good range of motion and no extensor lag. So when we looked at this case after having performed it and when we were in the planning phase, uh, the one uh, big issue that uh, I was facing was there is valgus and uh, there is literally no literature. We have everything talking of distal femoral osteotomies along with patella instability. But anyways, considering that there was uh, the defect which was there in the tibia and drawer pali has taught us we need to understand where the deformity lies. We need to draw the mechanical axes. We need to analyze the joint angles. We need to pick the bone and then calculate where the apex of the deformity is, perform the bone cuts, and then that will give us the correction. Hence the general rule that a genu valgum arises from the femur and a genu varum arises from the tibia is wrong. We always need to see where the deformity is corrected at that place. The second thing that we were considering here was, uh, is performing an MPFL enough? Well, there is now quite a bit of literature. This is uh, 2018 AJSM from the US, where they found that in almost 240 odd patients who did not have significant elevated TTTG distances or significant patella alta, isolated MPFL was adequate despite the presence of trochlear dysplasia, because we know from Dijon that trochlear dysplasia is present in almost 96% of patients who have patella instability. This is again from Leon, almost 200 patients where they found that in cases of recurrent patella instability and isolated MPFL would be enough. 
but the preoperative failure risks would be a significantly pat uh, high patella alter and a preoperative J sign. Now both these are present in this patient. And the other uh, factor we need to consider is what graph do we use? Is a particular type of graph for MPFL reconstruction superior? So now we know from this is from a large meta-analysis that autografts are not superior to allografts or synthetic grafts for an MPFL reconstruction. We also know that pediatric patients and those who undergo procedures which involve the adductor tendon as an autograph have high rates of recurrent instability. And we also know that selection of graft type is based on surgeon preference, comfort, and previous experience. So there is no clear cut winner. We, the decision to perform a cordyceps tendon was taken to prevent any uh, extra metal work in the patella. There is no implant in the patella, just one fixation on the femoral side. So that's my case. Thank you. Thank you, Anshu. Thank you. Wonderful case. Wonderful case and wonderful presentation as usual. Uh, I think uh, you have already discussed the case as well. Uh, uh, the points which could, which uh, one should ponder before uh, planning uh, any case with bony deformity. And the take-home message from your talk seems to be that MP, MPT and LDFA are two things which uh, we must always look at and uh, definitely note the uh, deformity, whether it lies in femur or tibia and then plan your corrective osteotomy. So I think very well done case, uh, very neatly presented as well. Any questions from the audience? Any comments from the panelists? Can I ask uh, a question, Dr. Milin? Yes, please, uh, sir. Please go ahead. Okay. So, uh, very interesting uh, case and I must congratulate you for making it very mathematical. Uh, my yes, question sir. is, in this case, the valgus was being corrected to yes, correct sir. the force of lateralization on the patellofemoral joint. Correct. Sir. So, there were two bony problems. One was petla alta and petla like TTTG more and also genu valgum. Correct, sir. Both these were causing lateralization force on the petella. Correct, sir. And we're not looking at lateral compartment osteoarthritis, things like that. Okay? That's not the issue. Here. Right. So, when you correct petla tendon by medializing and distalizing, you take away that force to a large extent. Correct, and you can sir. always do it a little more. So, right, what... I would have kind of uh, chickened out not doing the valgus correction in this case because I would think that just doing a small procedure of petla tendon shifting would give me what I want for alignment of the petlofemoral joint. Do you think that will be okay or would you end up with a recurrence if you don't do a corrective osteotomy as well? Well, I, I don't have a lot of experience with it, sir, but considering that... Uh... Uh, the current philosophy is we need to correct each deformity where it lies and hence going by that philosophy correcting the coronal alignment you know if present significantly is a part of the algorithm so that is why we went ahead with it and uh, now six seven months post of the patient is uh, pretty good we, there is no symptom she is performing all her activities so maybe this is a learning process. I, I, I can, don't know I can if this ask, was an overkill uh, or not. I can ask the other senior. Uh, this is often a dilemma I have. Because every time you add another bony procedure, there's a significant risk you take of making the patient worse. And the extent of surgery and the implant and the rehabilitation, everything goes up. So sometimes one wonders when there are two bony abnormalities, should you correct each and every one mathematically? Or should you just say, okay, this will take care of a lot of it. Because I know there is a two different approaches in, say, Europe and America. In America, they do almost everything by just MP fair, you know, medial petrofemoral. Whereas in Europe, they do every minute thing, you know, derotation, everything they want to correct. So, after all, patients are there as well as patients are here. So, sometimes there is a dilemma in my mind, should I go too much into bony surgery particularly when two are there, I want to chicken out and do only one. And in my humble experience, I have not regretted till now with recurrences. I must correct bony deformity, definitely. But my approach is not to become too mathematical that you have to correct everything because every surgery has a fallout. That's my, that's my impression. Anshu? 
so uh, correcting the valgus will definitely uh, you know bring back the engagement uh, in a in a better manner it reduces the q angle hence the patella starts to engage better and uh, patella alta had to be uh, corrected in this case any which was because the cd ratio was extremely high hence the tibial tubercle osteotomy was again mandated Uh, so these are two different uh, processes sir if the patella is still high and we have corrected the tracking it might still not engage so uh, since we are going to do it you know as well uh, do everything probably the european way of doing it instead of uh, of course an mpfl alone in this patient would be insufficient so yes, that I is agree. my take sir right So I think I will sum up this case with uh, requesting Anshu to collect a little more of evidence on this, and uh, let's find out how many cases in literature one can find of this kind, because it's a unilateral valgus at the tibia. So uh, we have to even think about the cause why it has caused only on one side, whether it was an injury to the epiphysis, premature epiphyseal closure on one side, and then only valgus deformity in the tibia, uh, because you know such deformities are not very common. and nice. un- uncommon things do not have any uh, uh, fixed yardsticks or uh, fixed footsteps to be followed so we request you to do that and please share it on the forum sure yeah? sir so that, thank I'll, you so I'll much anchu yeah. yeah thank you sir and uh, i think vinay uh, you can introduce the third speaker and we'll move ahead with the last talk for the uh, for the night so uh, so last speaker is uh, dr himansh gupta uh, he is from gaziabad a very eminent uh, arthroscopic surgeon and e specialist and is doing very well across up so himanshu are you there dr himanshu dr himanshu are you there himanshu uh, you are not on able mute. to hear you yes unmute yourself no we cannot hear you so himanshu is going to discuss about his technique of outside in a uh, large meniscal tear managed uh, all uh, outside in technique himanshu can you listen himanshu we can't hear you yeah i think he wants okay, to himanshu. and then come back again Yeah, he join. He's joining again. He sent a message on the chat box. So we can continue the discussion. Sir, I, uh, can I ask a question uh, to any of the panelists, uh, Sachin sir or uh, Raghu sir? Um, uh, the stripe C trochlear dysplasia is basically a medial uh, condyle dysplasia, and uh, if the medial condyle is dysplastic. uh why do we have a lateral patella dislocation in the first place hello am i audible yeah you audible yeah uh hello hello yeah, yeah. am i audible now yes yes sir okay so i'm sharing my screen thank you dr vinay might be the technical hitch which is coming so i'm putting my slides here am i visible now yeah yeah we can see you okay so i'll start, start my presentation now yeah sure so uh, today i am going to present uh, a novel technique of total outside in repair for a bucket handle tear i am dr imanshu i am based as gazibad and i am practicing knee and shoulder arthroscopic surgeon so just a little overview of the uh, scenario a meniscus plays a key role in post transmission and maintaining joint stability bucket handle tear almost account for 10% of the meniscal tears with lateral more common in acute scenario these tears are vertical longitudinal tears in red red or red white zone of the meniscus with displacement of the torn central fragment into the intercondylar notch the treatment remains uh, in two possibilities one is either doing a partial meniscectomy or doing a repair and as we all know meniscectomy leads to an early osteoarthritis so nowadays it's a trend to preserve whatever is there in the meniscus so the technical considerations that we need to uh, take care of before uh, planning for any bucket handle repair is the size of the central fragment and the zone of typical uh, zone of the tear which is typically in the red red or red white zone 
the quality of the meniscal tissue, which we can assess on the MR imaging, the extent of tear, and the most important part is whether it is involving the anterior and the posterior meniscal roots also. The difficulty with the with which the fragment is reduced, and whether after reduction it is a, being able to maintain inside the joint, and we should be able to do a stable fixation, which is necessary for healing. So, with the meniscal repair principle lies in two important things. One is in the solid primary fixation, which we all know, but the most important part is of a biological process that we need to generate so that the meniscus heals. So this is like we need to dissect all the uh, dead tissue aggressively, all the fibrous tissues from the margins of the meniscus. Sometimes we have to do a peripheral meniscectomy to achieve the bleeding margins also. We need to place sutures every five to seven millimeters. And if we are using anchors, the minimum distance that we recommend is more than five millimeters. The orientation into the meniscal tissues should be almost perpendicular to achieve a better stable fixation. The suture configuration, as we all know, the vertical mattress has caused the most important, most strength in amongst the all suture configurations. A number of stitches, we need to put minimum two to eight stitches, we can put at least two to eight stitches to achieve more stability into the meniscus. So zone specific techniques of meniscal repairs are very well defined into the literature. For the posterior horn, the popular techniques are of all inside and the inside out repair. For the body and interior horn, it is inside out, outside in and all inside. The current gold standard remains the inside out vertical mattress repairs as it can be used safely in all the zones for the radial tears also. And with the small incisions, auxiliary incisions, we can protect the neurovascular structures also. Nowadays, all inside approach is gaining popularity because of its ease and because of the implants which are available. But if it is not used in a proper way, this leads to a higher risk of new tears, tear propagation and contral damage. Sometimes if the implant is flipped inside the joint, it leads to irritation and we need to remove the meniscus entirely by using this approach. So coming on to my case, this is a 35 year old female has a history of ACL reconstruction done elsewhere almost four years back. She was doing good for last almost four years. She had an injury, twisting injury few weeks back. After that, she developed painful knee with off and on locking episodes. On clinical examination, Latchman was grade 2 with the end point. Pivot shift was positive. Tenderness was present over the medial joint line. Patient's macmorase was positive and the range of movement was full. The range of motion was full. As we can see on the MRI on the right side, we can see there is a bucket handle tear as evident in the double PCL sign. There is the, the ACL remnant is still present but it looks a little lax and there is a bucket handle tear of the medial meniscus. So planning this case, I had three options. One to do a meniscectomy with the revision ACL reconstruction. Second was to do a meniscal repair with a two stage revision ACL reconstruction. The third one was doing a meniscal repair with a single stage ACL reconstruction oblique augmentation. So I decided to go for the three. I'm not going into the detail above other things that uh, helped me in making this decision. So till now, my preferred technique was to repair the posterior horn with all inside techniques and the anterior two third of the meniscus I use an outside in technique. But in this case, I attempted a total outside in repair. So there were certain challenges in the mind before undergoing this procedure. The first one and the foremost was the tight posterior medial compartment, the risk of posterior neurovascular injury. I was not sure whether the meniscus will be anatomically reduced. Then there were risk of chondral lesion. And since I, it is an outside in technique, so we'll be putting a lot of suture knots, which can cause impingement over the capsule. So patient was positioned supine with leg in holding, leg in hanging down position with a thigh support so that the valgus press force is applied. Standard arthroscopy instrument is used. Additionally, I needed a 18 gauge spinal needles, monofilament sutures and metallic shuttling wires like chia wire from MyTech, knot pusher and knot cutter, and non-absorbable fiber sutures like orthopod number two, that's from my tech. So this is the surgical video of the patient. So when we started doing the diagnostic arthroscopy, we found that the bucket handle tear was from the medial meniscus. It was very well reducible. I did a pie cresting to open my posterior medial joint space. The ACL remnant looks less. 
So once I did the pike resting, the medial joint, the posterior medial joint space has opened. I did a meticulous resection of the fibrous tissues around the torn meniscus, did rasping. The meniscus was reduced with the help of the probe. But as we can see, this was coming out if we are not holding in position. So I decided to put first outside in suture in the central part of the meniscus to hold it in a proper position. So this suture acted like a traction suture. At the technique, outside in technique, the spinal lead is inserted through the superior part of the meniscus. The chia wire is inserted through it, retrieved through a transpatellar tendon portal, and a suture is railroaded over it. The similar step is being repeated from central part to the anterior part. So once two traction sutures were there inside the meniscus, I was able to do a good reduction, which was maintained by just giving a gentle traction from outside. So then I opened this valgus, I opened the knee by putting a valgus press plus a small external rotation of the TBI is generated and I was able to negotiate my needle around the posterior horn of the meniscus. The similar steps have been repeated and I passed the suture in the horizontal mattress fashion. So once the suture in the posterior horn is passed. It is again used to pull the meniscus at its place. So the similar sutures have been passed between the posterior horn and the middle part. The horizontal suture configuration is easily deliverable with the use of outside in needles. So the important, the advantage that we get with this spinal needle is that it is quite malleable. And if we are not getting a right angle of approach, we can just manipulate it and able to enter. As we can see on the left side, I have just given a small incision on the posterior medial aspect of the knee and all the sutures are being retrieved and tacked outside. So once I completed the superior surface of the meniscus, there was flipping on the under surface, which we can see a posterior horn part and the anterior horn part. The so similar steps have been repeated and the sutures are being retrieved from the under surface of the meniscus. So the posterior horn, again is being pierced on the under surface and the sutures have been passed through that. The same step has been repeated for the anterior part and once all the sutures have been passed, we are able to reduce the meniscus to its position. So all in all, we have put four, five uh, horizontal matters on the upper surface and two horizontal matter sutures on the under surface. So this leads to the reduction of meniscus to its footprint and needs a balanced kind of a repair in this scenario. So meniscus looks good, quite stable after this. As we can see on the left side, this is how we are putting the sutures. So for the ACL, just out of context, I have done a peroneus longus augmentation for uh, this ACL remnant and did a bit of tightening of ACL so that it holds in its position. So this is the six month follow up of this patient. I have kept the patient in brace for six weeks. For three weeks, it was only isometric cords that I have allowed. Partial weight bearing is allowed at three weeks and six weeks I allowed the full weight bearing. Patient took rehab for almost two and a half to three months. At six months, she is able to do all her activities without any problem. She has gained full range of movement. You can see on this uh, right side slide that there is a small incision on the posterior medial aspect and patient is quite comfortable after the surgery. So coming on to the technique, it has got certain advantages. As we are using the spinal needles, we have a better control of the angle of approach for putting sutures. No bigger incisions are required on the side to retrieve the sutures as neurovascular structures are quite far away. This procedure is relatively safe for neurovascular structure that we will see in the future slides about the review literature and why it is safe in this direction. We can give multiple fixation points for better stability. And since we are putting sutures on the under surface also, it leads to balancing of the meniscus. This is quite cost effective. We don't need any fancy implants for this. Just two orthocord sutures, a spinal needle and a shuttling wire is required. And probably since we have refinited the meniscus and capsule multiple times by piercing it, we probably have a better uh, healing potential of this meniscus. So the disadvantages which are associated with this uh, technique is it, it, there's always a difficulty in implicating a perpendicular suture orientation, especially when we are 
uh, near to the posterior horn sides. And if there is a any any kind of root tear, it is it would be a really difficult task to put the sutures at this level. We need to do a pie crusting of the MCN, and there is a suture notch impingement over the capsule as we are almost tying seven or eight knots on the outside. There's always a little bit of suture knot impingement over the capsule. There is a risk of injuring a posterior neurovascular structure if the certain landmarks are not followed. Excessive valgus stress can lead to iatrogenic MCL injury and contra lesions can happen due to multiple piercing of the uh, needles. The limitation is that uh, I have not tried this technique and I think it is it would be really difficult to do this procedure on the lateral bucket handle tear. Plus, an obese patient, it would be difficult to get a proper orientation and approach for uh, putting the needles. Now, coming on to the review literature, I was not able to find this technique for any bucket handle tear repair, though I have taken certain references to make this procedure safe. Now, this is a study from Journal of Arthroscopy where they have evaluated the uh, neurovascular safety uh, and clinical outcomes for outside and repair of meniscus for the posterior horn of medial meniscus. In this study, they have uh, done a cadaveric study of uh, six knees and they have made an entry point just central to the tendon of semi, uh, just central. Uh, they, they have made the entry point just central to semi tendinosis tendon and they have measured after dissection that the popliteal bundle is almost 2.4 centimeter away from this point and the stiffness nasal nerve is almost 4.6 centimeter away from this. They were able to get almost 88% satisfactory result without any neurovascular complication. This is another study which was done for assessing the safety for all inside meniscal repair uh, technique. So in this also, they have evaluated that the posterior horn of the medial meniscus that lies almost 15 to 20 millimeter away from the neurovascular bundle. But on the lateral side, this is hardly 10 millimeters away from the neurovascular bundle. So that makes it a safe procedure on the medial side. Now coming on to the repair, uh, meniscal repair meta-analysis, which is a recent one, it shows that inside out technique has a significantly higher mean operating time than all inside technique, which is quite a popular one. The outside in repair has a significantly higher rate of meniscal healing than the all inside repair. Now the complication rate and functional outcomes were probably the same in all the techniques. So here the take home message is that Total outside in repair technique is a valid option for medial meniscus tear in any zone. Pie crusting is must to open the posterior medial joint space and avoid contra lesion. Multiple suture placement on upper and under surface of the meniscus provide good stability and balancing of meniscal healing. Concomitant ACL reconstruction has better healing rates for bucket handle tear. An outside it technique is less technically demanding, safe and cost effective technique with good healing potentials. Thank you, Indian Arthroscopy Society, for giving me this opportunity to present my technique. Uh, thank you, Manshu, for a wonderful presentation. It was very elaborative. So, any questions from anybody? So, I have a question, uh, Manshu. Yeah. So, in your video, sure. you show you showed a small incision posteromedial to to take out the uh, maybe sutures and put a knot. So, uh, do, did you have any time the entrapment of saphenous nerve happening there? Because you want to saphenous open up the nerve is almost four and a half centimeters away from this incision. This is like a very incision close to the posterior medial joint line, and the saphenous nerve is quite far off from this area. So, even if you are going to posterior, uh, saphenous nerve is not, not a problem. No, it is not going to come. And the the, the length of the, the key is that you are using a flexible kind of a needle. When you do a valgus opening, you get a some amount of external rotation on the tibia also, which helps in. Uh, uh, manipulating and uh, going on the posterior side of the medial meniscus. So, can I ask you a question? Uh, so, uh, is it your root, uh, regular practice or this is one odd case where you got such a lax knee where there was ACL injury, you could pie crust, lean and thin patient and a valgus could open the joint to such an extent. Normally, one never uh, uh, is able to see you know such a wider opening on, uh, on the medial side. So, you suggest that this can be done or this should be thought of in all the patients or few select ones where it is, uh, you know, can be technically easier. Because I have my own doubts regarding, you know, one, uh, one fits all uh, kind of statement if that is made in this context. 
So I have never said that this can be used for any case, but I have been practicing from last two years and I have been trying to reduce the cost of my meniscal repair. So I do almost pike resting in all of my medial side meniscal repair cases and I have been using all inside sutures only on the posterior horn. So one suture is something which I use on the posterior horn, posterior side, rest all I have been trying to do uh, with an outside in technique. So in this one odd case, I was lucky to get that medial opening on the side and I was able to negotiate my needle. That provoked my thought that the bucket handle tears can be approached through this technique on the medial side. But from last two, two and a half years, I barely use one or by barely use two all inside sutures for the posterior horn. I've been restricting myself with one suture on the posterior side and rest all I'm doing outside in. Nonetheless, it's a wonderful presentation and I think uh, very great results as well. But vis-a-vis uh, -vis inside out, uh, how do you look at this procedure? Like inside out also cost-wise almost goes the same. If you are using, you know, uh, there are quite a few uh, uh, ready-to-use needles which are loaded with uh, uh, fiber wire number two and uh, you can jolly well use them. So, so I, I'm like very convinced that all inside is... There is no challenge to all inside, no, no, but no, 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 so no, no, no. I'm I, saying I inside out, points. inside out. No, sorry, inside out. Sorry, inside out. There is no so, challenge. So that cost effectivity, is... huh, cost yes. effectivity can also be attained by doing an inside out and so, releasing incision. Now you have taken a very small incision. That's a very nice thing, but you can do the same phenomena by taking a larger incision. You are more safe. You can see the posterior medial capsule, and you can bend your 18 number needle to negotiate the bend which you need to. So, in fact, taking a releasing incision would make your life easier and your application can be put to a little more number of patients. Do you agree? Definitely, there is no doubt that um, inside out is always an option and we need zone specific cannulas to do that. We need to do a, a bigger incision for that. So, that's how my technique is different. I've been practicing outside in as I, I have briefed it. I've been using it without any problem. So, I'm avoiding the inside out um, uh, technique for my cases. No, Himanshu. I'm saying if you start taking a little bigger incision, okay. outside in indications you can increase because you will be able to see the posterior medial capsule very well. Okay. And okay. you would be more safe. You would have more manipulating uh, uh, angles because you're using a spinal wheel. So, you can be bent. Yes. yes. Isn't it? Okay, so, that's a nice idea. I will yeah. try to do that. That's yeah, a nice idea. so your indication can be extended to more number of patients. That is what yes. I'm saying. Yes, Thank you, sir. I'll, I'll try to bigger do that. incision. Yeah. yeah, a little bigger incision. I'll right. try to do that. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes, Simanshu, one last question. Uh, yes. I saw it was an excellent presentation and the good results as well. Um, you, I saw that uh, your um, the uh, suture configuration was in the horizontal uh, frame. Uh, initially, when I started, even I used the horizontal uh, suture configuration. But um, biomechanical studies have shown that vertical configuration, that is one in capsule and one in is uh, better. But uh, I'm still not sure. Uh, what is your take or have you gone through any literature like that? So definitely a vertical mattress has got a better strength. But I think in this scenario, putting a horizontal mattress gives me a relatively more stability, a relatively better chance to reduce my meniscus and holding it in a proper position. So probably since I'm using seven or eight horizontal, six, seven or eight <coughs> horizontal mattress sutures, probably that um, I can rely on that. I can rely on that. One one point is uh, horizontal is better is so that better area of coverage is there so that we yeah, can maybe. this number. Yes, of, yes, yes. As vertical, you have to use much more. Uh, much, much, much more sutures and the suture not impingement can be a problem in that scenario. Okay, Sandeep, uh, I think uh, we have already ran out of time. So who's going to make the concluding remarks? Uh, so one uh, but, yeah. was to uh, Dr. Anshu and Himanshu. So can you uh, finish off your write-up uh, for this presentation? By uh, we'll, uh, I think we're not sure. we'll still I'll live. Do that. Yeah, so that we can uh, finish off the, you know, the uh, publication out of this presentation. Okay, now. I'll send you in a day or two. Maybe next week, anytime I'll send you the same. Amelie, sir, you can come. Uh, Monday, you'll get mine. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, all the presenters, uh, Raghu, Anshu, Imanshu, it was a wonderful meeting. Thank you, IS, Office Bearers, for giving us, me and Vinay, this opportunity 
to moderate uh, this wonderful academic session. Uh, the discussions were really up to the mark and uh, pretty much uh, was talked about the salient and the critical points involved in the respective surgeries. So thank you so much, everyone, for the enthusiastic participation. Thank you, IS, and uh, let the knowledge and the wisdom be 